Hey guys, welcome to another Vlog Babble, and today we got some more stuff to talk about, I guess. So uh, grab a drink and just hang out. Remember anything that we talk about here, usually you can find the link underneath at the video description. So, what do we got going on here? Oh, okay, WC News, or not much. I covered most of it in the last uh, Vlog Babble, but... Uh, remember Draconic Awards at draconicawards.com and uh, check out, you know, the upcoming events. Hopefully you're around or maybe you want to fly out for one of them. Really cool. Well, uh, you know, we run the contest and we have two circuits, the Journeyman, which is for more beginner-like people, and the Masters, which is for the more uh, winning, warding, kick-ass, you know, been-at-it-years type of uh, artist. But the Best of Show trophy, I just wanted to show this off a little, is the Draconic Award... Um, trophy here right here it's the best of show trophy uh on the local circuits you can only get this by placing top tier um but at regionals these trophies are used for uh you know best of shows and uh the best of uh best of shows and best of categories uh, mainly so there you have it but anyways i thought i'd like to show that off already if you guys haven't seen it yet um if you haven't noticed lately uh, or some of the new releases if you're not following facebook uh, we released a uh, article, which you can find on WGConsortium.com. Uh, we write articles, or people submit in articles uh, for that, and we post them up if we like them. But uh, Mary Prophet, one of our WCU mentors, uh, posted a article called uh, Rustic Bricks from Foil, Making Rustic Bricks from Foil. It's actually a pretty cool uh, article. Uh, you just take foil and make rustic bricks out of it, and she shows you how to do it. Uh, links down below. I just released uh, Part 5 of the Building Desert Table for... Malifo, <clears throat> and I did in the last on that that part of the video, ask what people had if they had any suggestions or comments about what I should put on the front part of the table because it's really barren on the front part of the table. It's really open, um, and originally I was planning to put you know like decrepit houses or old wooden you know houses from an old like western town type of thing, um, but I wanted to see what people you know suggested. And some people suggested, and this is one thing I had in mind of putting in there, but I, there was no room to put in there. They, they say, do an ab abandoned mines entrance, um, which really would be the, if you guys watched the video, it would be the top, if you're looking at it from the front, top left um, area where you could put a mine entrance there, but there's like no room there. There's one area where I can, but then that means I have to dig into uh, the course and stuff. So I have to look, and... I've been toying around with the idea in my head, but you guys have been suggesting a lot, so maybe I will put one there. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, some people suggested watering hole, but I'm not sure about the watering hole because there's a dry riverbed running down the middle of the table. So if there's a water hole, it'd be a dry water hole, right? Because if the river's dry, the water hole's got to be dry. Um, animal bones? Well, it's Malifaux, so thinking on ma animals, we could do some big rhino or some, something like that. I don't know. It, it doesn't have to be round. It could be something that you can't really describe, but it is Malifaux, so it could have some weird stuff in it. So I think I might look into making, you know, getting some kind of animal bones, maybe from a toy or something, and stick that on there. <clears throat> People say uh, graveyard, grave markers, which, if again, if you look in the front of the board, it'd be the middle right, where it goes up one tier. Um... I was planning to put a graveyard there, um, but I wanted more cover, so other than grave markers, I'll probably put a old western type of, um, what do you call it, those little little houses <laughs> for where you bury your dead, I guess. Uh, someone said train station. Train station won't work on this board because there's a river running down the middle, and there wouldn't be enough room to actually show that it's a train station, because the train station's pretty big, right? Uh, look at, I'll look into it to see what happens. Uh, dilapidated shacks and houses, which it was the original idea. Uh, I like this one, old rusted out water tower. That'd be fun to make. So maybe they'll have a water tower, uh, probably you know next to the lake, one to the side of the lakes, and just have it all broken down and dilapidated. But anyway, so uh, check that video out, uh, or check the whole series out because it's part five. So I've been doing it in parts, and uh, just showing people how I got from scratch to. You know, a full uh, desert table terrain board for Malifo. Uh, I also just released uh, selecting a Badger airbrush. Basically, I go through and, you know, I get a lot of questions about uh, because of the sales that Amazon has on the 2020, the Sotai 2020. So she gets that or if they should get the Chrome. Um, and I explain all in there about the difference between the Chrome and the Sotar and then also talk about uh, the Patriot 105. So that hopefully that'll help you select one of the airbrushes if you've been thinking about getting it. 
Also uh, highlight some other eye brushes, as well as um, some brushes that I, do, I use once in a while. And also, for you guys out there that have been keeping up on it, Kickstarter coming out pretty soon for the Badger Pistol Grip airbrush. This is the WC X Fire. I think that's that's a product name right now, but we'll probably stick with it. I know we'll have to see. We'll have to do some search and stuff. But this is the uh, pistol grip for uh, single action pistol grip. Uh, do massive base coating and 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 um, priming and great for terrain and stuff like that. So here you go. <clears throat> Let's see what we got here. WC T-shirts. Oh, you know what? People have been asking us about the WC T-shirt, where they could buy one and stuff. I never put them up for sale. I didn't think about it. And uh, it would be a good way to support WC. So what do you guys think? Do you guys want that? If you've seen it around, it's the one with the dragon, the right side here. And then the, the WC logo on the back. And then the WC logo on the badger. And the Game of the Gears logo on the, on the sleeve. So, yeah, let me know if any of you guys watching this are interested in buying a T-shirt. Probably go around 20 or $21 um, plus shipping. Uh, but anyways, uh, maybe I'll put a pre-order up because so, we have to reach a certain amount to get a right uh, um, cost for them and stuff. And uh, coming from the last vlog babble, uh, Adam was watching it and then he he texted me and says, "Hey, did you see my tweet?" And um, the tweet says, "I just heard from GW business guy Chris Kaler at the ACD Distributor Con." No loss of models between 8th and 9th for Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. So we have to see how it all comes out. My main worry is just all the models that I've, I've, I've collected over the years for Warhammer Battle, if I'm not using them anymore, if they become the crap or, you know, out of date, then why should I have them? I mean, one or two units every, like, five years, I understand that. But I was afraid that they're going to cut, like, half of the armies or whatever. Um, but we'll see how that happens. Again, we just gotta wait till it comes out. Um, <clears throat> so on the Forge World airbrushing paints, now, I've I've seen this around just recently. I guess that was something that uh, they re they ex they exposed during the Warhammer World uh, grand opening, I, I think. Um, but <clears throat> Spud Tate did a really good round on it, and the links down below. Uh, just watch that, and then come back here, and then. Uh, Hear my reply, basically, I guess. Um, by the way, the guy is too nice to rant, so it's not really a rant. It's more like a discussion, I guess. <laughs> Anyways, um, good work on that video, Spud. And he talks about, first of all, the price, which is Forge World, so no surprise there. And then he's talking about also about the bottles that comes in. It doesn't come with dropper bottles. It comes with flip-top bottles, the old Citadel paints, flip-top bottles. Um, but first of all, Let's get all this out of the way. Paints are paints, okay? You paint with them, and you can airbrush with them, okay? The only difference between airbrushing paints, quote-unquote airbrushing paints, is that it's just diluted to be able to drop right into the airbrush. Now, you can take regular paints, and as long as you thin it right, you can shoot it through an airbrush. Use pretty much any paints out there, right? Acrylic, enamel, or lacquer paints. You can do it. You just have to thin it, and then you thin it for the correct medium. Like, you know, acrylic, you could use water or airbrush medium, or lacquer paints, you, you know, you use lacquer thinner. Uh, enamel, same thing, enamel thinner, um, to thin those paints down, and it becomes airbrushing paints. Now, now we released this to market. I guess it's, a, you know, Model Air did that with Vallejo, and it's just pre-thinned paint ready to go on the airbrush. Now they might take a, the line and then create airbrush paints out of it and make new colors out of it, and that would make a difference on the line. But anyways, any paints, even the, you know, any paints out there, even the scale 75 paints here. Sorry, this is where I stick some stuff. Oops. So, oh, that's not good. That's my prototype of the, uh, of the gun, which I can't find. The bottle for it. Oh, it's up there. The like, even the scale Model 75 um, sets here, it's it's marketed for valid for brush and airbrush. I don't know if you can see that here. <clears throat> brush for airbrush, right? Um, again, it's paint. So, there's no real special thing that they make to make it into airbrush paints. It's just diluted paint. Diluted to for, for airbrushing. So, don't get knackered into that. You could use P3s. Thin it right, and you could spray it through the airbrush. Same with Vallejo's uh, Model Air or Color. 
model color. Uh, same with, uh, you know, Army Painter. Same with uh, Reaper. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so don't get snackered into thinking, oh, it's more expensive because it's airbrush paints. It's not. There's no... I mean, Minotaur is for airbrush uh, ready paints. And uh, we try to hit the market with a lower price than everyone else when we uh, release that. So, again, there's nothing... Smart. You don't spit in it and suddenly becomes airbrushing paint. You don't piss in it and suddenly becomes airbrushing paint. It's just paint diluted for airbrushing. Okay? Um, he also mentioned... Uh, the pots. All right? It's not in a dropper bottle. It's not in one of these dropper bottles, or it's not in uh, your typical Vallejo type of dropper bottles. Which, if I can find one here, one of these. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's in a flat, open top uh, bottle, and then the, now, okay. The, it's this question of ease. Okay, you can get them in dropper bottles. You can make them in dropper bottles to make it easier for people to drop it in the airbrush. Okay, but it's never always been like that. Like the model air way, way, way back for the, sorry, not the model, the uh, model color. What the heck did Badger call it? I don't know. Before Minotaurs, they they had paints before Minotaurs, and they had it in a screw on top bottle, and then people normal, you know, people back in the day they would use these. It came in these bottles, and then you would just use a dropper to put it into your. Uh, your airbrush so that really that shouldn't even be part of the pricing other than you know if it costs more to do it in dropper bottles it really really doesn't I mean it does a little but you know for Minotaur they you know the bottles that use for Minotaur you know Badger's been using that supplier for a while that's why we were stuck with that when we were making the Minotaur paints um, I asked you know Badger and, and Ken can we put it into the Vallejo type of bottles um, first off uh, the amount that we want to put out, which is a lot more than a Vallejo bottle, uh, wouldn't fit in that bottle, okay? So we, that's why one of that reason we went to that. And second, they're already using, they're already ordering masks for his, their other paint lines. So uh, that's why we got stuck with those dropper bottles, which is fine. It works fine. It works well. So again, the only thing that should reflect the price really is uh, uh the, the production of the paints uh, and the supplies for the paints, right? So it comes to the question of now what what Spotate was ranting about was the price. Okay, now this is GW, this is Forge World. If you're not surprised by now that they upped the price because it's quote-unquote Forge World or quote-unquote GW, uh, then you've been under rock because they do that all the time. They base pricing based on their IP, based on their, their name. Now this is... Uh, markup based on their brand. It's branding markup. Okay, and they can get away with it. So, as much as we want to rat and stuff, they're probably going to sell the crap out of those paints. Regardless, just because it has the Forge World tag on it. And is it evil? I guess. It's evil that they have it so high. So high. It's like three, 350 something pounds or quids or, or what have you. So that's like, what, almost five, six dollars USD? So, I don't know. That is expensive for one bottle of paint. I mean, that's that's uh, the same size as uh, the you know the uh, Vallejo bottles, I believe. So yeah, um, the pricing is based on uh, the branding. So is it evil? I don't know. It's just basic marketing for business. Uh, if they could sell at that price, they will. And there's no point in saying, oh, you know, they're not gonna you know sell any or whatever. They probably will. And that's 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 the sucky part of my, about it. So, as always, I don't use GW paints. Period. Okay, because here's the thing, it's expensive. Why should I buy GW paints? Talking about Citadel paints, or the airbrushing Forge World paints, when I could go get Vallejo, when I could get Minotaur, when I could get um, P3s, uh, um, Army Painter, Scale 75, much much more cheaper, and it does. Just as good or even better job than the GW paints, right? Now, I can't say anything for the Forge World airbrushing paints because I haven't tested them out, I haven't used them or anything. But again, don't get snackered into certain things. We're already paying a premium on their freaking models, okay? Premium on their codexes, on their books. All right, that's enough for me to play with. I don't need to go buy a $50 clipper. I don't need to go buy, you know, a $5 paint bottle of paint for, you know, one ounce when I get a lot more from a different brand and stuff like that. So... You know, to a lot of people, you're buying into the brand, and that's what you're buying. That's what you're paying for. You're paying for also for the product, obviously. But, you know, they up the price, the margins on the, because of the brand. So, um, 
you know, I agree with Spud here. It's bullshit. But then again, if you buy their models and books, you're already buying into the marketing. So that's why I don't feel very guilty about not buying their other stuff. Uh, there's so much support that I could go with when, you know, you look at stuff and say, wow, they are overpriced because they are overpriced because I know how the manufacturing works on the models. I know how the family manufacturer works on publication books. I know how the manufacturer works on paints. I've, you know, I've been through it. I know it. I've seen it. I've done it. So it's just like, why? Why, why is it so expensive? Um, they're selling and they're marketing up per their brand. So if the brand marketing works, they're going to stick with it. There's no one, two ways or, around that. So, you know, as a hobbyist, you know, I'm saying, you know, go, go screw yourself. As a business guy, I'm just like, well, it's just smart marketing. Simple as that. Now, is it smart marketing that they're going to push everyone out of the business because they're so expensive? Maybe, but now this day and age with all the games and other companies popping up everywhere, they'll just lose their share sooner or later. You know, people are going to start, stop playing their games and then go to other games because there's plenty of lovely games out there. Excellent, fun, exciting uh, war games out there. Other companies making paints, making brushes, making whatever, uh, you know, hobby tools at much less of a price that you could get them at and works great. So we'll see what happens in the future. But yeah, good going, Spud. Even though you try to rant, you're just too nice of a guy to rant, but still. So check out his video. Okay, the next thing up is uh, our war okay, our very own Wargamer Girl is doing her own Patreon thin thing, so go check it out and, and uh, you know, help her out and uh, be a patron uh, if you like her her uh, Wargaming uh, videos, uh, especially her battle reports, because a lot of work going into that. So this opens up the whole new question of should people like us who make YouTube channel, uh, YouTube videos about Wargaming uh, put up things like Patreon or, or ask for money or what have you. Now, see, there's, there's this little tiny, tiny, right, little crusading group out there who believes that you should not be asking money, period, for this hobby because we're paying enough. All right, that's great for you. You know, pay for whatever, get your free shit, go do whatever. But when someone that does content, good content, I mean, it takes time to make these videos, okay? Um, and it's not just putting it in front of your face, put on the webcam, turn it on, and boom, there you go. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's the basics of going to it. Boom, let it go, record it, and then upload it with no editing. That's the easiest thing. But when you want high-quality stuff, like what Miranda does with her battle reports, what I do with my battle reports, or what Les does with her painting video, his painting videos, or what I do with my tips videos, we put passion in this. We put um, pride into what we do. All right, so that's why we don't go the shortcut route. We want high production quality videos or as high as we can make it for you guys to enjoy so that we can get our message out clear so you guys can enjoy it with, you know, without trying to listen to what the heck he's saying because the voice is, the, the sound's too low or you can barely hear it because it's all crackling because of the shitty mic or, you know, they don't know how to do the camera work. Everything's a blur or everything's overexposed and all you get is, uh, you know, a white blank screen type of thing. Um... You know, there's a lot that goes into it. So, you know, a lot of people are like, what do you think? Do you think that it's okay for us to, like, you know, ask for Patreon money? And then, you know, here's the thing. With, with Wargaming Girl, she's just asking for donations, really. She's not saying, look, if you don't pay, you're not going to get any videos or you're not going to get any premium videos or, or what have you. It's just a thing that, like, look, you support me. Uh, it helps me out to make these videos, you know. Um, so, going through all that, it takes a lot, especially... Uh, you know, shooting like something like Vlog Babble. This is why I went really low on on this now. And when I first started this, um, if you've seen my other Vlog Babbles, I've been messing around with formats and stuff. This is one where I'm just doing it like uh, you know Phil Philip DeFranco, where I'm just jumping all over screen, doing whatever. Uh, that takes editing, and you know it takes me to film it. it. Takes me 20 minutes to film it. it. Takes me two hours to edit it. Right, like this, I am just recording it, putting in you know a little you know side screen thingy here. Um, just say it's vlog babble and then uh, put in some intros and outros and, and then let it go. That's my basic editing. You know, that's, you know, record it, put it up, no cuts, no editing or whatever. So you're going to hear a lot of, you know, bullshit. So, but then when, you know, I do tips and tricks or painting tutorials, rarely, or I do battle reports, especially battle reports, the way I do them, uh, it takes a long ass time. Like the Warhammer Fantasy Battle I did with Philip. Okay, we we took he came over Saturday, recorded for about three hours only because he blew up his wizard first turn, so the game was pretty short. But then, you know, I took it, put into 
uh, and, it, and it was done by multiple cameras too. So I have to go there and source a uh, monitor each each cut and everything like that. So I take the video in, I go find music for it, um, which usually I pay from one of those royalty free sites type of music places. Um, I do all the cuts and editing. I, I I do all the dice rolls. I do all the the UI over, overlay and everything like that. And then when something happens, I got that little small part and stuff like that. We recorded that and then about it took me about maybe four or five months because I don't work on this full-time. If I work on the full-time, I could probably get that video out with all the bells and whistles in a week. A full-time work on eight hours a day, about. Yeah, maybe a week and a half. Okay, so it's not that easy, especially when you're doing you know high-end stuff that Miranda's doing. Um, then, you know... You know, you got to look at them and say, well, ah, they're spending all their free time uh, to do this. Okay. And honestly, she doesn't work full time doing the videos. I don't work full time doing these videos. Okay. The only people that I know that actually does full time really, I think, is uh, Mini Wargaming J, Mini Wargaming themselves, Beast of War. Uh, they're always up. They're always putting out videos really quick because that's all they do. All right. Miranda has a job, two jobs. And she works her ass off on those. And then she goes home. And on her free time, usually it means the weekend or something, record a battle rep, go down and edit it and stuff like that. And her battle rep, I'm going to tell you, is not like a three-hour job or something. It's just as long as uh, it takes for me to do battle reps. That's why she doesn't do that many. Okay? She's putting all the bells and whistles in it. But honestly, in battle reps, you don't have to because battle reps are still popular. Even if you don't put bells and whistles in it, we just like doing it. You know, I, I talked to Dave about it and I say... Uh, damn, man, you're putting all these bat reps and stuff. He goes, yeah, but I'm not. we're not putting stuff like you and Miranda are putting on your... Really, that's why we could pump those things out. And that's because they have to do it because that's part of their business. You know, For me and Miranda, it isn't part of business. And then when we have to do videos, like right now, I'm doing this vlog babble because I want to keep my channel going and up because I've been out for a long time. The reason why I'm out for a long time is because I have a full-time job. I'm a CTO at, at a mass retail company. So that means that's a 40, 50, 60, sometimes 70 hour job a week. Okay. And then in between that, I got the WC doing the events and the Draconic Awards and uh, running some cons, uh, our own cons up in, you know, uh, the, in London. And then we're, we're planning some other cons in the U.S., our own very, you know, own very cons, very own cons, right? So... And, you know, I have people that help me, like Caleb. He runs most of the planning and stuff for the Traconic Awards and the WC Mentor programs, but they need a lot of guidance until they get it down. And once that's down, you know, I have Chrissy working on all the gaming groups. Sorry, airplane coming up. All right, anyways, you probably should be able to hear me. Anyway, so, you know, she's working on those groups of stuff, but I have to watch her, too, to make sure she does it. But most times she can do it on her own. That's an easy job, but... It's a job nevertheless. So I still have people helping, yet I still don't have enough time to do everything, right? So when I'm doing the, the project plannings, when I'm planning you know, the cons, or when I'm planning to go help a con when running Draconic Awards, or if they need us to run hobby stuff and stuff, that takes time. They don't pay us to do it. I do it because we love it and because we're trying to you know, expand the hobby and stuff and, and make it fun for people. So I have that going, and then I barely have time to paint anymore, <clears throat> my own stuff especially. And uh, and if I if I do that, then I don't have time to record videos, okay, or work on videos. Um, so now that I'm recording, I could have been painting, I could have been working, what have you. So it's a lot of juggling for me, and uh, for Miranda, I'm sure it's a lot of juggling for her too, especially in those long ass, you know, battery ports and stuff. So those people that say, "Oh, it's bad to you know ask for money," why? I don't understand. It's not like you're losing; and you're still getting your free videos. She's just asking for donations. Now, what I, you know, I don't under, I guess I don't understand that line of thinking where you shouldn't be making money off of what we're doing. Why? What was it to you, anyways? Unless you actually want to support, uh, you know, uh, your 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 YouTube content uh, creator. So. Again, let me know. What do you guys think about that? Should people ask for Patreon? Even though you don't lose your free videos, some people do say, hey, there's behind the scenes, you're going to get videos from here. What do you think about those? You know, so there, there's a line. There's a, a group set. There's a, different ways of thinking. I want to know what do you guys think about asking for money, doing through, through either through Patreon or, or, or donations to PayPal or something just to help them get up. Just to get help. Also, the money helps to, not just for time, but get new equipment. Because so, right now, I have some decent equipment, but I do want to upgrade because if I upgrade, I can make even more battle um, 
awesome battle reports with with less time because you know having a 4k camera is better than having the current camera i'm recording on because i could zoom in easier without loss of you know a picture and stuff like that so that means i don't need a dice rolling cam etc etc so it's a lot of work and maybe one day i'll make a video and just have you guys sit through with me uh while you know making a bat whip which is going to be a pain in the butt uh to record because it's going to be a long hours i'll have to do certain cuts and stuff but again it's just a lot of work and honestly you know i don't want to make that video because <laughs> that video is is going to be horrible to to deal with uh because you know recording while I'm, I'm doing it on the computer and stuff um i don't do it straight up i always have to leave i i'm recording i know i'm editing for like 10 minutes and suddenly work has to kick in so i have to leave uh you know editing and then go do my work two, three hours, and then say, oh, hey, I got free time, go back in, do more editing, and then suddenly, someone calls me and says, you know, Caleb calls me and says, hey, we need this done, we need to get, you know, covers for coins and stuff, and suddenly I'm off looking for certain, you know, you know things to, to help make the next Draconic Awards win, uh, work correctly and stuff, so, again, it's not bitching, I just do this stuff for fun, and it is a hobby, the whole organizing all the stuff, and having fun, uh, 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 going to events and organizing certain things. That's part of the fun for us. Part of the same thing as doing the videos. Part of the, the hobby for me. So don't think of this as a rant or complaining. I do it a lot mostly for you guys. It's not like uh, I'm doing it for fame. Pfft, right? Fame? I'm making a YouTube channel. I'm not fucking... Uh, <clears throat> I'm not freaking... Uh, what's his name? Brad Pitt or what have you, right? Um, so there's no fame there. I just make a stupid small YouTube channel. Uh, there's no money in that. Trust me, there is no money. Even at... Freaking as much subscribers I have, there's not much money out of it. I mean, I can make that much money in an hour that I that I get for a uh, a month uh, making money on YouTube. Okay, simple as that. So there's no money in this unless you're su you're super 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 big like those guys that have like gazillion freaking subscribers while they're sitting in front of the camera talking about their underwear. Whatever. So, anyways, uh, check out Wargaming Girls Patreon links down on below. Um, great shares. Sometimes I find great shares, so I want to share it with you guys here. Um, Michael Becker, Mike Becker. Sorry, I hope. Oh shoot, I use his full name. Eek. Okay, whatever. Mike. Forget the Becker part. Uh, he. Uh, I saw a post on Facebook in the W Terrain Builder WGC Terrain Builder group, and um, he's using Liquid Tech Gloss Gel to make uh, icy buildup. Like he did, he put some on on uh, you know barrel, so it looked like it's. Iced on on the on the ground and ice falling down the barrel itself. So uh, really cool tip there, a really good share. So check out the link below and check it out. And uh, we'll just go on the Q and A because that's pretty much all I have there. Uh, okay, so Q and A. Remember the Q and A is really I'm just picking questions that people ask me uh, online, either on YouTube or Facebook or whatever that has to either deal with hobby, doesn't deal with hobby, or just asking questions through. The vlog babble, so it doesn't have to be about the hobbies. It could be about anything. Um, just get ready if it gets political. Sorry. Okay, uh, Drasky Vanderhoff. Okay, now this is re these are uh, comments from my last vlog babble. Okay, go for Kings of War. Ronnie said that Kings of War will have an army list for all Warhammer C uh, War Fantasy bad uh, armies. Obviously, they will be outside of the Kings of War universe, but you can play it with that. Uh, with what you have, try it out. Okay, I mean, I've seen, I've read through King of War. I didn't read it deeply, but it, it was okay. I mean, I'm a Warhammer Fantasy player, so it was really hard for me to adapt over, right? Um, but I, I don't know. I'll, I'll take a look at it, and with all the other questions, that's the same answer. I'll take a look at it. But I'm not really hip. Uh, I'm not really a huge fan of, of uh, Kings of War from the last time I saw the rules, but that was a couple of years ago, so who knows. Uh, so... Yeah, I'll check that out. Uh, Kings of War, remember guys, if Warhammer Fantasy Battle is dropping off your radar, check out Kings of War. Uh, actually, a lot of the comments, they say, check out Kings of War. Uh, Killix says, the faction to me are less of an issue regarding getting models. I will play the game if the game is better. And with that, I mean much better at competitive levels and fun of gameplay. Um, better said, good terrain interactions. So I guess he has his little beast with Warhammer Fantasy Battle rules. But that's a good point, too. Are the rules good, too, to play with? <clears throat> a lot of people get turned off when new additions come out. 
but then a lot of people like the new edition. So that's that's usually a 50-50 chance that people like the rules and they don't hate the rules, you know. Like Warhammer 40k, really those rules, especially for competitive play, is horrible. That's why we have um, FrontlineGaming.org uh, rewriting rules for ITC uh, competitive play. Well, putting in restrictions of saying that you can or can't do during tournament play in their tournaments, which they came out with a great, great um, way to do it for you know some people. But then you look at it and a lot of people don't like the way they do with ITC. So, you know, if they run an event, they make their own thing. So that I think that's one of the things I like about the Warhammer 40K community is that, look, GW, just make the damn models, okay, and make whatever the core rules are, all right, and forget, don't worry about competitive play. We'll, we'll fucking do our own restriction list and our rules for competitive play. I mean, if it doesn't, if it doesn't work for the community, they'll go and, 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 and do it themselves, especially when they have a good following, like... Um, Frontline Gaming is doing a huge, awesome job at creating the whole ITC circuit and everything. And that seems to be very, very popular with a lot of people. And there's other, you know, events and cons around that write their own, you know, restrictions, lists and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> again, you know, Killax is right. It's a better, you know, as long as the rules are, are better or good, then that's what some people will get some people to play or kick back in again. Uh, for me, it's about the models as well. I don't want to lose thousand dollars of models to send there uh, collecting dust. Especially if a new edition comes along. Uh, Starlight Night Flames says, Relax, it's rumors. Don't worry. Be happy. Some may be true. Most probably won't be. Nothing is stopping you from playing Ace Edition instead if you really don't like the changes that eventually come. And there is probably nothing that stops you from playing your existing armies in the next edition either if it's just the unit army you think that upset you. Good point. But, I don't want to play 8th edition. If they're coming out with 9th edition, I want to play 9th edition. What's the point of playing 8th edition if they're not going to support it anymore? After a while, you know, I'm playing 8th edition and I'm like, alright, there's no updates to army books, there's no updates to facts, uh, and there's nothing that, that's, that's, that's being supported in the rules to, uh, to want me to play 8th edition anymore. So the other option is quit, sell out my models, or go to ninth edition. If I go to ninth edition, I'm probably going to have to sell off models if they don't cut out half of the models to play uh, the game, anyways. But see, that's where I'm going. Is that uh, look? Don't cut out so many models. It's like one or two units, fine. I understand. But when you're just doing such a drastic change, that will piss me off. Again, we don't know yet. We'll see what happens when it comes out. Let's hope. Cross your fingers. Whatever. Uh, okay. So these are questions from other stuff. General questions here. Clark Kent. Cool name. Uh, I watched your video about the modern mastering rusting technique. Very awesome. Um, very awesome way to achieve rush quickly and realistically. Question I wanted to ask is, can you use an airbrush with the modern master ME208-6 reactive metallic iron paint through a airbrush? Any advice on this would be great. Thanks. Okay. Yes, you can shoot it through an airbrush. I've done it before. You can take the iron metal uh, paint and shoot through airbrush. You're going to have to uh, thin it down though. Just thin it out with water and you'll be fine. And just brush. You're probably going to have to uh, airbrush it. You're probably going to have to do a couple of coats though. I do about two or three coats before it really kicked in for the rust activator. Uh, Medwin. Is Windex just a glass cleaner with ammonia content in it? As my country, it is somewhat nowhere to be found. Oh, by the way, he asked a bunch of questions on this, so I'm going to ask some, some of it that I thought was important that you guys might want to hear about, too. Yes, window cleaner. Uh, Windex is a window cleaner with ammonia in it. You buy Windex without ammonia, but you should be okay with the window cleaners overseas. I know, I know some of you guys in UK use a different type of window cleaner. Uh, but either remember the whole argument about not using Windex because of ammonia. I don't have a problem with it. Some people do. Um, so you're going to have to remember to keep that in mind. Or you just buy the Windex without the ammonia content in it. Okay. He also asks, is a cold, we is a cold weather a no-no when you're painting? Most models say it affects how the paint will dry and result frosting cracks. Have you experienced with those things? Okay. I'm not experiencing anything with frosting and cracking. And honestly, I live in LA. It does not get cold here. Literally, it does not get cold here. It's a damn desert dust bowl, hot as hell most of the time. Um, so I don't experience that. But yes, weather does affect the way the paint dries. 
I've not heard of frosting or cracks. That's a different problem. Cracks happen if you're using some kind of weird, if you're thinning the paint or if you're cutting the paint with some kind of weird thing like Windex. Don't do that. I used to do that, but don't do that because it will cause cracks because what it does is it breaks down the pigments. And if, if you got the certain right conditions, it will crack because the Windex is breaking down the paint while it's dry. Um, I don't think that has anything to do with the weather, though. Someone might want to correct me if they've seen that before. Frosting again. Has, I'm taking... I'm assuming that frosting you're talking about when you're doing varnishing and stuff. That, I haven't really figured it out because, especially for the Vallejo varnish, uh, varnish, I get a lot of reports about frosting. And usually to fix that is you just spray gloss over it and do it again. But when you're doing varnish, especially the Vallejo varnish, do it in light coats and do it multiple coats. And you should be fine. As for frosting because of the weather on that, I don't know. Uh, I've never seen it happen before. The only thing I just say is spray indoors where you have a controlled environment. Go get a um, go get a, a spray booth. You know, there's cheap spray booths under hundred dollars for you to just buy. It's like there's one there's there's one I did a review on, really cheap one, it's like sixty five dollars and there's an eighty dollar one out there that I'm about to do a review on. Um, it's been sitting there for a year because I promised you guys I'd make a bit, no review of it, but just kind of got lost in the fold. Um, but yeah, uh, stay tuned for that, uh, you know, that video. Uh, his other questions are, oh, Vallejo mediums, have you tried using them? What other uses? I'm kind of confused with, with their airbrush thinner as I've been told that they are also thinners. Can you clarify this? Okay, first of all, thinner is not a medium, Okay. Mediums is what you do is mix it in with the paint to change its property. For instance, if it's gloss paint, you can put matte medium in it and, and then flatten the paint, uh, finish out a little. Uh, you could use uh, flow, I'm sorry, flow aid, which is kind of a medium that, that helps the paint flow um, and actually flow them through the airbrush pretty well if you put a couple of drops in it. Uh, those are medium. That's the stuff that you mix with paint. Now, there's also varnishes. Varnishes is what you put over the model, over when the paint is dry to change its properties. Like, for most of my models, I spray a matte medium over it when I'm completely done. Actually, I, I spray a gloss coat over it, which is usually using Pledge Feature Floor Shine, okay? And then I'll put, and that, that creates a hard shell, so it protects my model. Then I spray it over to flatten it with Liquitex matte medium, okay? So those are the difference between a varnish and a medium like uh, airbrushing medium, okay. This here is what you use to thin certain paints, uh, acrylic paints, okay. And I, I suggest using that if you're thinning paints. If they don't have their own thinner, uh, for their paint line, then use that. I had no problem with that. That works really well. Now for Vallejo thinner, Vallejo is a thinner. It's thinner, so you just thin the paint with it. So you cut it with paint, like, um, you know, when if you need to uh, thin it down because it's too thick. Use the thinner or use the airbrush medium. Okay, uh, the thinner really is is kind of a medium, I guess. There's other things to, about you know it is a medium. So just think of it as medium. I'm not going to get too too advanced about that. Uh, airbrush thinner, Vallejo airbrush thinner is a medium and it's a medium, a thinner medium for their paint line. You use it for other paint lines. Uh, it might act weird. It might not. I I've thinned it with uh, what is it P3s I believe, and it worked decently but if p3 had their own thinner i suggest getting that but they don't so you could use Vallejo thinner you could use the airbrush liquitex airbrush uh, medium works well so i hope that answers that question there what's between a medium and a uh, uh and a finish what have you uh let's see here what paints do you use when top coating models now I'm assuming that you mean varnishing it and finishing it uh, with a varnish. I just said, like I said, I pledge for gloss coating, pledge feature floor shine. This is something that you uh, shine and wax your floors with. Works great and it's cheap. It's a big old bottle. It's like eight to 12 bucks, I think. It's a big old bottle. It lasts forever. The, I, I bought two bottles of these two and a half, three years ago. This is the last bottle. This is how much I still have left. Okay, um, for flat and satin, I use Liquitex matte, matte varnish, like I showed you before. And uh, yeah, that's uh, what I use. Again, the way I do it is when I'm finished with a model, uh, my last steps are to future floor shine it, 
give it a nice hard uh, gloss coat um, and then I will spray the matte varnish on or satin uh, varnish on it uh, or just leave it gloss if that's what I want but usually I, I, I matte coat it I'm also interested in wargaming what can you recommend some figures I prefer the dragons uh, I prefer dragons and wolves do they have those kind of games yes they do Warhammer Fantasy has a lot of dragons in it, but it's not dragon concentric. Um, wolves, you can play Warhammer 40k. There's a whole Space Wolf faction. That's what I play. Uh, I don't know, guys. Help me out here. Leave in comments below if you have any other suggestions about games that, that have wolves and dragons in it. I know Wrath of Kings have a faction that has very wolfy type things. Okay, if that helps you. Uh, that's it for him. Southern Wargaming. Just got an airbrush. Really enjoy your videos. I also got the Army Painter Mega Paint Set. Any ideas on how the paint will do in an airbrush? I'm sure I will need to thin them. I just have no idea on the ratio. Also, the brush I just got is an Iwata Neo with a .35 needle. Thanks to keep up the good work. Uh, thank you for watching. And yes, Army Painter um, paints will go through an airbrush. You, yeah, again, yes, you do have to thin it. What do, you, do I suggest thinning? Water or the Liquid Tech Airbrush Medium. You could also try any other type. You could also try the Valley Hill Thinner. I think that they might work on those paints uh, without acting weird. But again, buy a good bottle of these. If you airbrush, buy a good bottle of this. Okay, this will last you for a while and it's, it's cheap. I got the medium bottle because I can buy the large bottle on Amazon. It was out of stock. Otherwise, I'd just buy like two, three, or four of those bottles and, and do with it for thinning paints if, if the paint line doesn't have actual thinners. Um, Devin, I had to skim through a bunch of airbrush tutorials but couldn't find what PSI used for dual action brush. Is there a range you fiddle between? Oh, by the way, going back to Southern Wargaming, there will be a video coming up about thinning paints as part of the intermediate... Uh, Airbrush series, which I need to finish up. I, I took a huge break from that series. Um, but again, for Devin, uh, what PS? Okay, here's another review I will be doing for the intermittent air airbrushing. But for the answer right now, it depends on what you are doing. Okay, first off, if you're doing dual using a dual action airbrush, it doesn't matter what piece you're using. It only matters depending on the type of airbrush you're using. Okay, if you're using a gravity fed airbrush where you put in the paint. And it flows down like this. You don't need as much uh, PSI. So you could go down. I mean, I, I shoot down to five PSI with a brush like this when I'm doing details. Now, when you have something that uh, is a bottom fed, this is when you put a bottle up like this. You, there is a minimum PSI where it'll start working because you have to pull the paint up. I think it's 15 PSI, I mean, around there. And then uh, anything higher than that, it should start pulling the paint out. But if it's too low, it won't pull the paint out. So again, it's not the dual action part. It's the type of airbrush, uh, type of feed part of the airbrush. Okay, that the PSI doesn't matter. Now, the PSI range that I shoot at is like 35, 40, depending on my, the compressor I have uh, at the time. I used to have a more powerful compressor, so I was able to go up to 60. Um, but between 35, I'm doing base coating and priming with... Um, when I'm doing minute details, I might go to 5 or 8 PSI. Again, it depends on what you're doing, so I can't, I can't just tell you, uh, you know, which PSI, PSI to do whatever job. It's really, you, you, it'll be built in when you, when you keep learning and get experience with an airbrush. You'll know what PSI is to go at to do whatever you need to do. Okay, but when you're starting out, start out at 20, okay, and then, and then when you're spraying your models... You're just doing base coat whatever, 20 is fine. And then when you're trying to do details and it's just not wor working, it's hitting too hard. Like the space you want to hit is just way wider than you want. Lower the PSI if you're going down. Because when you're doing details, you have to go close to your models, right? So you have to lower the PSI because the closer to the model, if you're spraying at 30 PSI and you don't have trigger control, which takes a lot of practice at that high of a PSI and you're going, you know, that close to the model, the paint's going to do, uh, it's going to do two things. It's going to spider and go... Or it's going to spit back at you. And you'll know that you're shooting way too high at you. And then the next thing you know, your models have, you know, gun wounds in them. Okay. So I can't tell you exactly why. You know, you know, the, 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 I'll go more in depth about that in the PSI video uh, that's going to come out probably in a week or two. Um, uh, awesome Crossing. On a lacquer based paint, can I use Windex when I want to switch between colors? Or pour the color into the uh, cup to clean? Or do I have to use a lacquer thinner? And how about acrylics? Can I use Windex or would water or isopropic alcohol be uh, best? Okay. 
Awesome Crossing. No, you cannot clean lacquered base paints and airbrush with Windex. That should not work, okay? You gotta use lacquer uh, thinner, right? Just to be safe. Because I don't think Windex will break down lacquer paint. Okay, for enamel, you would use enamel thinner. Because Windex won't work on enamel. I know that one for sure. Um, for acrylics, yes. Windex will work. You could also use water. Won't clean it that well because there's nothing in water to break down the paint. Isopropyl alcohol can work too. And, and a lot of people use that too. I use a mix of both. I Windex through it uh, for color changes. But when I'm putting the airbrush down sometimes. And it's a really messy session. All right, for you guys out there that have a dirty mind, screw you, okay? Um, if you're having a dirty session, uh, then I would do both. I would clean it out with Windex and then rinse it out with isopropyl alcohol and then Windex again because isopropyl alcohol don't break down paint the way that Windex breaks down paint, right? Because sometimes the paint will still sit there if you use isopropyl alcohol, and that's if the paint is kind of thick on the walls of the, of the airbrush, okay? If there's, it's a good way to rinse the paint out. But there's going to be paint on the walls, and then that's when I go to Windex, spray. I use this tip right here and stick it in the... Again, for those guys that have bad, uh, you know, have uh, dirty minds, I use the tip here and then stick it in the hole and spray really hard, okay? And that would clear out the, uh, the, the paint that's stuck on the walls. So uh, there you have it. I use both for acrylic. And finally, Bonkers AV. Thanks, man. Very useful. How do you like to find conversion on the Patriot 105? After I bought it, I can't seem to fit it properly. Always get bubbling up in the paint cup and it gets messy as hell. Thank you. It's another problem with, uh, another person having a problem with being messy. Okay. Um, first off, yes, the fine conversion is fine. It just breaks it, it just brings it down to the 0 0.3 needle instead of 0 0.5. Um, I'm actually thinking I'm just going back to 0 0.5 on that because um, for detailed brush, um, I, just, I mainly use my uh, Sotar now, and then sometimes my Patriot, but I don't use Patriots to do much details anymore. So going back to 5.0, I could go back and you know, do wide sprays, but then I'm using 360 to do that. So 0.3 is fine. It doesn't do anything other than lower the needle size, which changes some of the jobs that I would do on it. Now for you, you're saying you get bubbling up in the paint cup. Did you just change out the needle? If you just change out the needle, that's not going to work. You, you're, you should have a conversion set that comes with the spray regulator, which is the top tip of this. Here, this is the spray regulator. It's small. And then the the tip, the spray tip right here. Okay, you would take that out too. You would switch this piece, that piece, and the needle uh, into the different size. Now, if you're just switching out needles the same size, if you're switching a needle to a 3.0 needle to a 3.0 needle because you bumped it or something, you don't need to switch out those two pieces in the front. Okay? But when you're converting to a different size for the badger airbrushes, uh, you will have to put in the new needle tip and the, and most of the time the needle regulator. It, it's very weird. It's different for each airbrush. But uh, that's it, guys. Thank you for sitting through with me in these long as vlog babble. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you are painting right now while you're watching this because that's always a good thing to do. Um, other than that, see you guys later. More videos come this week, and uh, yeah, Kubla Khan is in the next weekend, so might not have a vlog babble, or might do the vlog babble there. Maybe just sitting there. Uh, in the hotel room or whatever, do the vlog babble there. That's it, guys. Talk to you later. Bye.